So the next step is to understand how to add some form of, some simple form of user interaction in our applications. I'm saying simple form because uh, this kind of, well, like right now we are able to do that kind of interaction that was custom in, uh, in websites uh, maybe 10 years ago or 15 years ago, uh, before the web 2.0, all the social stuff and so on. We will learn later how to make page more dynamic with changing elements uh, with the continuous refreshing. Right now the interaction will be very uh, simple just based on forms and buttons. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, just to, to change the exercise, not to, to create uh, on the same exercise, we can imagine a sort of a login, imagine a login without password to make it simple. So on the home page of our website, uh, I can enter my, my name here in this field, and I can submit the name, I can enter into the, in the website. And uh, uh, if I write my name, I go to a login page, let's say, that just confirm, give me a confirmation, okay, I got your name. And then from that, I can go to the, in, I can return to the same index page. You see that you have index here and index there. But after you log in, the index page has changed. So it's no longer welcome, welcome to the project, but welcome your name to the project. And instead of having the login information, I have the logout command. And maybe also some additional functions uh, for the website, only accessible to those uh, who logged in. So actually, the, the, the index template must uh, behave in two different ways according to whether the user is logged in or not. So we must have this kind of information we must store this kind of information somewhere. From the HTTP point of view, from the HTTP protocol point of view, from the web server point of view, this request, index.html, and this request, index.html, are the same. So the web server cannot help us in distinguishing between the two. Uh, in making the second one different from the first one. I, we need to add something to the web server at the application level in order to be able to store the information that that specific user coming from that specific computer on that browser is the same in this page as, the, as before. And it's the same who just check their login. Okay, this knowledge is called a session. So uh, we don't navigate websites through pages. The HTTP protocol, the web server, deliver pages. But the, our application deliver, delivers sessions. A session is a sequence of pages that have some logical connection between them and share some information. So we will learn how to create interactive elements like these forms, how to capture the data, the information that the user enters in these uh, uh, interactive elements, and how to store this information into the session so that all the pages of the website can use this information. Right? One step at a time. First step, how to let the user interact with the website. This is easy because we can use the forms in the HTML language. So HTML as a language for creating uh, forms, actually. Mm -hmm. So we have a, a form tag that contains uh, all the interactive elements and, and then a set of inputs, input elements, that defines what kind of interaction may ex expect from a user. Inputs may be a text box, uh, a text area, maybe a check button, maybe a set of radio buttons, maybe a drop down menu and so on. Mm -hmm. And then uh, buttons you can add, you can add option groups and so on. So the first, uh, we have the link for, for the complete reference here if you want. So the, fir the first thing you, we, we should do is to enrich our HTML template on the index page 
with a login form. So inside the new paragraph, you see that now I'm editing an index uh, and PyCharms is understanding my HTML. So it's helping me to write uh, HTML by closing the text for me and so on. Check the syntax. It's easier than before when I was writing to a string. So I can have a form element. And the form element uh, has one critical attribute which is called the action. The action of a form is the name of a web page that should uh, uh, check the data entered by the user. So when I click on submit to a form, the form data is being sent to a web page. Which ones I define, which one I define in this uh, uh, action attribute. So for me, it would be the login, uh, the, yes, the login page. I called it login in my, where is that? In my plan. So this will be built a page that checks whether the login information is valid. And then inside the form, I put all the uh, elements. I what, what I want to write, enter name and then the place for the name and submit. So a label, enter name, inside this I have an input, type equal uh, to text, and uh, Imagine that you have more than one text uh, field in your application, in your form. So to distinguish between the different text fields, uh, you must give a name to each of them. Okay, so I call this user. HTML forms uh, work, uh, as most of the web technology, on a dictionary base. Huh? A uh, form is a dictionary with names uh, as keys, and the names correspond to the different input elements, and the values correspond to what the user typed in, or the, the user selections. So we have a name user and a value, whatever I write. And all the information in the web uh, uh, is say, stored and processed as a set of uh, key value pairs, like dictionaries. Hmm? Okay, I have this label and then I have another input element that is a, of a submit button. Input type submit generates the submit button. The button that when pressed will submit the whole form. Where? To this login page. This will be all in one line because the form uh, there, there, uh, I wrote this in three lines, but uh, in the HTML code, there's nothing that goes to the, to the next line here. There's only one paragraph that starts here and then the end ends there. Hmm? Would be better to do to include the paragraph within the form from the syntax point of view. Okay. So let's check what we did. We will get an error. Don't worry. Okay, we are getting an error because uh, could not build uh, the address for the endpoint login hmm? because we didn't uh, create, define a function yet. So let's create a fake one, up to truth, log slash login.html. Def login. Don't do nothing for a moment. Def login, oh, sorry, the parenthesis. Okay. So right now, start it. Okay. I have this field, 
this is the label, this is the text input, and this is the submit input. If instead of submit we want to write something more friendly, we could change in the index uh, the, 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 there's an attribute called value that determines the text written on the button. So enter, for example. So we change the string here. Okay, so uh, capturing value from the users just mean, means uh, learning the form commands in HTML. Hmm? So this set, this set of tags uh, and uh, what kind of, uh, yeah, this, this set of uh, tags, uh, for example, all the inputs uh, can generate different, what is that? Inputs of different types uh, that are explained there. Okay. Then, when I, where am I? Here. When I write a name here, Fulvio, and click the submit button, enter in this case, the browser puts together all the input fields and sends them to the action page. In this case, you see that action is login.html. I click enter. And then I'm calling the login.html file. Of course, I get a Python error because th this page is not returning any HTML, and we need to do that. OK? How can this login page uh, extract these values? You see that this value has been encoded in the URL with a, a name equal value syntax. Name equals value. Name value pair. Hmm? Everywhere. So uh, all the form inputs are sent by the browser to the action page into the URL of the request or into the post request in the case of, of post, but uh, we come to that later. And the Flask retrieves these values and puts them into Guess what? A Python dictionary. This Python dictionary is called, is the form value of a request object. So you have in Flask, we didn't use it yet, but in Flask we have the, this object called, this variable called the request. Huh? Request contains all the information about the incoming request. So one of these information items is the form. Form is a dictionary that contains whether if the, <coughs> the request was came from a form submission, contains all the value, key value pairs of the different input elements. So forgetting the name of the user input field, you can index the dictionary with the key user and get the value. So we are here in the login method, in the login page. The first thing we, we need to know is to know what name has been written by the user. So the name of the input text was user. So we can extract from request dot form, index the dictionary with the key user. Request must be imported. And save this somewhere. OK? So we get this name. And we can now use this name as a for example, parameter for other pages for our application. So right now, this Python variable in the login page contains the text that the user has just written in the index page. 
So it's a way of passing information from one page to another. For example, I can create a new template, which is the login page, login.html template. And in this page, I can write uh, welcome user, user. And then I have the link to continue. the index page oops there's something missing here closing quote closing tag continue so I can greet the user by knowing his name for doing that I need to call a template with, uh, it's called login.html, with the parameter user equal to user. This user on the left is the name of the parameter that is used here inside the, page, the template. The user on the right is the name of a Python variable that I just initialized here. Okay? The two may be the same, let's just not confuse them. So if I save this and uh, the web server restarted, if I submit it again, what? Start, okay. Central request of the server could not understand. Why? Login, user, okay. What's wrong with you? Let me just check whether the error is in the template or, okay. Did I import the correct request? Yes. What did I do wrong? Request.form user. It happens.
didn't want to go into the request and get login. Okay. request. Why? Okay. And Check just this one, then we, we skip over. Okay, uh, never mind, I, I'll fix it. Let me check, because I, I already have the solution, of course. The only difference that I see is uh, using the post method. So let me just try to modify it. Let, let's try. Yeah, and then I'll. Uh, Okay. Should also work in the other way, but I need to figure out why. Uh, right now we can. I wanted to move to post later, but. Uh, okay, so. Sorry for the lost time. Uh, We have the index that gets the input data, packs a dictionary with the username, and this dictionary is caught by the login page. I query the login page, and the user is used in, uh, sorry, and is used in the template uh, for the login method. So on the website, this is the home page. I write a, a name, funny name. And when I click enter, welcome user funny name. Okay? The only modification I made, which is something that I would have done anyway later, is to uh, specify that the form data has to be sent, sorry, here the index, uh, with the post method instead of the get method. The difference is in the HTTP protocol. If I send the form data, with the, with the get method, all data is uh, written in the URL, in the web address line. You saw before, question mark, name equal to Fulvio. If I use the post method, which is a different HTTP command, you see that uh, there is nothing in the web address at the top. 
all the form data is sent in the request body. So it's not visible, it doesn't uh, say pollute the, the request URL, which is a better way anyway of, of using the, the form. So I didn't want to introduce post too soon, but uh, now the, the error made me do it. So I specify that the form should be submitted with an HTTP method called POST, and I specify that the login function should respond to the login.html address when the request comes with method POST. Okay. Then I need to go back. What do I want to do in my application? I need to go back here to the login page. And this time, the login page should remember my name. How can it remember my name? It needs, I need in the login page to store my name somewhere where the index page can retrieve it and check it. Right? So this is a remember information from page to page, and this information should be specific for every user. I cannot just write a file somewhere and say, okay, the username is Fulvio, and write it somewhere in the project files. Because if you are connecting, if you are a different user and you are connecting to the website at the same time as me, you cannot have the same, and you go to the index, you shouldn't see my name. So we need a, a way to store information from page to page that the web server forgets by design, is made to forget. I need to a place where, to store info, where being able to store information that is different for every user of the website, okay? Um, because otherwise, when I go to the index page, I have no way of remembering what the name was just, what was the name that the user just typed five seconds ago. Uh, the technique for doing that is called uh, sessions. No? A session is a, a mechanism for storing user-specific data during the navigation. And in HTTP, it's based basically on the mechanism of cookies. Um, let me tell you a story. Imagine that my memory goes away every time I blink. Okay, which is not far from the truth. Uh, so when I talk to you, I look in your eyes, and I, I can stare at you, I can understand what you say, I can reply to your question, but the moment I blink, I forget about you. I don't even know you anymore. So how can we have a conversation? How can I pretend to remember you if I forget every time, and the web server does this. I have a trick. Every time I reply something to, to you, I write on a piece of paper the important information about our conversation. Not everything we said, but just the important points. So that when I blink, before uh, looking at you in the face, I can first, okay, check what I've written, and then be up to speed with the conversation. I talk to you, I reply again, I update my notes, and then well, I forget again. This works if I'm doing just one conversation at a time. I have me, this note paper with me. But what happens if I'm talking to two people at the same time, the web server accepts accepts a parallel connection from many users. I have two not papers. Right, when I'm talking to you, I write in the left. When I'm talking to you, I write in the right one. So I have different notes for every user connected to the website. 
The issue is if I blink and I open the eyes again, I have two users, but which is which? Because I forgot. I know that one of my users is related to this information and the other user is related to that information. Which is which? So this trick works, but I shouldn't, the one, I shouldn't be the one keeping the notes. I should give the interview to you. So I write my notes, and before and while I reply to you, pop, I give you my notes. Maybe I close them so that you can read them. It's not information for you anyway. It's information for me. And the other not paper note I give to the other person. So I can just forget everything and be happy until you come for the next conversation. For the next conversation, your promise, my promise is to try my best to remember you. Your promise is to give me back the paper notes. So you're coming, you give me my paper note that has been folded and closed, you didn't look at it. I can open it, read what I need to know, and then continue the conversation, upload the update, sorry, update information, close it again, send it to you, give you the answer, and then forget. So each of you has a small paper note, it's called a cookie in HTTP, a small text file with some information that is totally useless for you, but is useful for the web server to catch up with the conversation at the point and to res resume it from the point where it was interrupted, the last web page. It's very clumsy, it's very strange. But HTTP was designed in a memoryless way, and, but we, and we want to create uh, applications that do have memory of us, and so we need to rely on this strange mechanism. So every website you visit, every website you visit with your browser, gives you one or two or more or many cookies that are small text files that are not meaningful to you, are just meaningful to the website to remember what you did one second ago or what you did last week, to remember your login, to remember your history or whatever. You promise, the browser actually promises, to give to the, every website to give back the same cookies that the, that specific website gave them. So if I visit the website number one and website number two, my browser has two separate cookies, or two sets of cookies, one for website one, and we, that will only be sent to website one, and those coming from website two will only be sent to website two. Okay, so there is no, at this level, there is no problem with privacy, privacy issues. Okay, every website will just receive the same information that the, the website itself has generated. So I'm not sending the website anything new. It's information that I received from them, I just give it to back. I just give it back. So this is, uh, then there are two different implementations of this. One is that in the paper note, I write the actual values of the information that I need. Okay, and then I try to encrypt it, encrypt it in some way so that you cannot modify it. And the other option is just in the cookie, in the paper note, I only write a key. And then I save into my database, into the persistent level in the database, a dictionary related to that key. The difference is that um, if I, in the second case, I may have, a, have many values, long values, without transferring every time a big cookie from me and my client. I adjust the cookie representing the key of the session, the session key, and the values corresponding to this session key are stored in a database locally, in the server. Database can store, like having many, you know, uh, the difference uh, with, with, uh, with my small uh, play is that uh, I'm not giving you the full ticket. I'm just cutting a corner and give you this small piece of paper. I keep the, 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 the big sheet with me, but in the corner there's a small number that matches the number of my paper. 
So you just need to give me the number, and I know which one uh, is which, because they, they match the numbers. I can keep the information with me, I can share the number with you, this number is meaningless, totally meaningless to you. If you try to change it, it will not match any of the available ones, because they're not making one, two, three consecutive numbers easy to guess. They should be hard to guess these numbers, so that you cannot make your own section and impersonate another user. Okay. So. From the implementation point of view, these are all complex mechanisms with expiration and validity and domain of, the, of these cookies. Practically, what I have is a strange mechanism that allows me to create a dictionary that persists, which is persistent across different calls. And uh, guess what? In Flash, in Flask, sorry. Um, I have one object called session, which look like, looks like one single object, one single dictionary. But actually, it's a different dictionary for every user. So if I store something in the, in the session dictionary, this information is only stored in, you know, you can have, imagine many copies of this session, one for every user. When in my page I store something into the session, this will be available only from the, within the same session, from, from the same user. So it's not a global object. It's a global to each user, for every user. So all the pages see the same information for that user. For another, another user, all the pages see the information for the other user. So it's all automatic from our point of view. We can implement our web pages by thinking at one user at a time, and the multiplexing between the user is done, is done automatically through these cookie mechanisms. And the session object, which is every time we get a call, Flask retrieves the correct session from the list of the many open sessions. As I said, I don't want you to tamper with my session information. I don't want you to tamper with my memory, with my knowledge of you. Because otherwise, you might fool me into pretending that you just passed the exam with the 35 score huh? uh, by changing it. Passed the exam, no, you change it with yes, huh? and you give it back to me, I need to trust. Huh? I don't want you to tamper with the information, so this information, this session cookie should be encrypted. And uh, Flask does it in the wrong way. It's a simple but wrong way. I specify an encryption key in the application file, and every cookie is encrypted with this key. I wouldn't suggest it for critical websites. It's enough for our purposes where nothing is secure. There are more powerful session, um, session man uh, management mechanisms than the, than the one implemented in Flask. So to make a long story short, if I want to remember information across pages, I need to use the session dictionary, and for using the session dictionary, I need to define an encryption key for my application. It may be whatever, as long as it's not easy to guess from the users. Practically, application secret key, I can set it as, as soon as I create the application. It can be any string. This is real secret, yeah. Huh? And this is a string that is used for encrypting the, um, the cookies. If you don't know the string, you cannot decrypt them. At this point, we can, as soon as we get the user information, the name of the user, we can also save it into the session. Section is a dictionary. So we can choose the key to store the information and the value. So there are too many user strings here. This user is the name of the HTML input element. This is the name of a local Python variable. The same here, local Python variable. This is a session key. 
This is again the local Python variable, and this is the template parameter. Okay? You can call them A, B, C, D if you prefer. Uh, and session might be imported. Of course. Once I have this, in all the other pages, I can query this information. So in the index page, I could check the user. I can use the user. I can also pass the user information to the template. By the way, the template already has automatic access to the, to the, to the user, to the session, sorry. So it was written here. We skipped it a bit. But uh, the templates can access immediately some objects like request for form values. So the template could also access the form or session or G, which is a strange variable for storing global values, so a sort of a session of all sessions. So this is, is the G is uh, shared between all sessions to store application level uh, values, seldom used. So we can query the session within the Python code or directly within the template. You see that within the template, we can use uh, Session, the session object to get the information. And uh, like this. Oh, sorry. I... So in the login page, sorry, not the login, the index page, we may interpolate also the username here if it's defined. Session. Sorry. user. So we can check index. We enter a name, ABC. Welcome user ABC. This ABC is taken from the form that they just submitted. It was part of this HTTP request. I extract it from the HTTP request. I save it into the session, login code. Login code. Extract from the request, saves into the session. When I click on continue, normally the value of this parameter is lost. In this case, I save it into the session, and so this login page may use it. Okay. Uh, how, how may I forget it? <laughs> For example, if I stop the server and I start it again, you see that if I reload this page, sorry, what happened? Why did you remember it? Okay. Change the encryption. Okay. Um, so in this case, the dictionary session is defined, but it's empty under the key user because nobody st any, uh, stored anything in that. So the other thing we need to do is here to change this form. When the user is already logged in, we can change, we must change the information there. So we should not display the login form again. We can do that directly in the, um, in the template. Say, okay, we can use an if statement, if session, user is empty, then do this. 
Otherwise, otherwise, write the logout information, write a logout comment. So uh, I should write another text with the uh, uh, for logout. And I need to define another method for logging out the user, for logging the user out. So I add another one, app route. Logout dot HTML. Def logout. And how to invalidate the session. I can delete. Uh, or just session, just storing a space. Uh, sorry, an empty string. So invite the username. Hmm? So the, I, I should uh, define my own convention. What makes a session valid? So in this case, the session is valid if the user key contains a non-empty string. Maybe to have something more robust, uh, I could have also another ses session attribute. For example, session valid. That can be true or false, for example, which is easier to check. Hmm? So maybe it's easier and it's also faster to check a session may be valid or not valid. And then if it's valid, I know that I can query additional session information. Hmm? It's up to me, there's no standard, there's no way, no, there's no rule or saying what uh, makes me understand whether a session is valid, is not valid, the user has registered or not. I should decide the, the general structure of what I write in my paper notes so that they are easy to read. I need to read them quickly to understand quickly how to react when I get this information. Hmm? So one possibility is when I create one session, I mark it as valid. When I when the user logs out, I mark it as invalid. So if I forget to delete some value somewhere, I always have this flag that tells me without ambiguity if, I, if the user, if the current user is within or without. Um, the session. So, uh, the logout makes the session invalid. I can also update this test, which is easier. If the session is valid, it's also easier to read. Do this or do that. And then I need to return some HTML here. After logout, what should I do? Well, I should write an HTML page saying, you have been successfully logged out. Continue to the home page. This is a bit boring and redundant. There is a way for automatically sending the user to a different page. So the logout page doesn't have any HTML by itself. It does something, logs you out, and then the next logical thing is to go back to the index page. So I don't want to write a white page with only one link for the user to click to go to the index page. 
I want to tell, to the, tell the browser, go to the index page. So the response that I send from a, a, a function, an application page, may be an HTML or may be a redirection command. And this tells to the browser, Dudley, uh, okay, please browser, call this other page. I force the browser to call another HTTP request. This response is empty for you, it's done. The next one should be this one. And so I ask the browser to, uh, to, to request a different page. And this is, usual, uh, is, uh, is useful for, web pay, for actions that didn't need to do only some, say, housekeeping stuff, but don't, don't have any information to show to the user. So I can use this trick, redirect, and then to the URL that should be our destination, in the, our case, the index, and redirect also should be imported. So in this case, what logout does will be invisible, will be very quick, will invalidate the session, and then the browser will call login again. Let's see, let's see it in practice. Reload. Let me change the encryption key so that we invalidate the old session. Okay, so we are logged out here. There's no username. I pick one, pick one. I click on enter. Welcome user, pick one. I continue, and this is the same index page, which is wrong. I forgot, yes, the logout is not shown, so why isn't it? Session valid, shouldn't be necessary, but. Sorry? No, it's when I, is the session, okay. No, but I, I, I'm totally stupid because all these modifications should have done, been done in the index page, hmm? not in the login page. Sorry. So, well, this is okay. I should prevent the form in login in index from displaying. Okay, so the login, welcome user, okay, the index. So it's, I made a modification in the wrong file, in the wrong template, excuse me. So in the index page, if the session is not valid, the other way around. If the session is valid, then write the logout. Otherwise, if the session is not valid, write the login form. Let's try it from the beginning. So we start, we enter a name, welcome user, okay. Goes back to index, right now, okay, the username is pulled from the section, session and is interpolated into the page. And uh, I change the bit uh, that part of the page, depending on a session variable. All of this is done, is done automatically by the template. The template knows how to adapt uh, depending on, uh, uh, on the session state. If I click on logout, the logout function should be called. 
And what the logout function does is to invalidate the session by wiping out the username and uh, storing the valid flag uh, to a false value, and then immediately sending you to the index page. So this page that will render differently because now the session will be invalid. Cross your fingers. Okay. So this is again the index page for a, lo a non logged out, a non logged in user, a logged out user. If I, I may at this point log in with a different username, I'm greeted as different, and this is the session for the different user until it logs out and again. So I'm creating and destroying the sessions. Well, actually, it's the same sessions, uh, it's the same cookies, but I store different information in them, and so they appear as different um, my, my users, actually. Yeah? Yes. Yeah. So, I, I repeat the question for the for the recordings. You you say in the logout uh, I'm doing the redirection to the index. Another possibility could have been. This one, rendering the, temp the same, the login template, not the login, I continue, the index template directly from here. Yes. Right? So the visual effect would have been the same. The difference Main difference is, uh, well, there are two main differences. One is here, the address. I would have seen visually the home page with the logout address there. And if I refresh the browser, I'm calling logout again, which is, mm, in this case, doesn't do any harm, but in general, uh, so, uh, if I go to index, then I'm on index, uh, and uh, if I refresh, I will refresh index, and there's nothing wrong with that. This is the first. Uh, and the second is that uh, our index is really very simple. It doesn't have any logic. But if index would have any logic in it, uh, I would require to replicate it there. Okay? So it's better to leave uh, one page for one, for one function. The downside is that it requires uh, two round trips for, for logging out. When I click on logout, uh, here, I'm actually making two HTTP calls. One to the logout page, then the redirection information comes back, uh, and so I ask for an uh, index and I get the index back. So I, the penalty I'm paying for having this clean separation between the logout page, which is invisible to the user, and the login page, which is the actual um, displayed page, is an additional HTTP request. If we, we, are, we are seeing that uh, one normal page generates already 30 or 40 HTTP requests, so one more. And it's a, a small time penalty, but only that. Okay. Okay. So now we can go back to the diversion that we set. So just to uh, recap the, what, what we said, we learned how to create web application with the Flask basic functions. Then we understood the, that uh, um, <coughs> templates are a, good, are, good, are a good way of organizing our code, so we studied how to organize templates. From templates, we added user interaction, means forms and the form dictionary to get information. 
And we soon realized that this user information must be stored somewhere. And so we added sections and the session dictionary, okay? Um, at this point, uh, we may have uh, a better understanding that, uh, and we go back to the basic, uh, uh, say, working of, of Flask, uh, that uh, some web pages could be personalized in some way, could be dynamically named. Uh, for example, you could, uh, with just one root, define the behavior of a group of pages. If I write a root slash user, that will match an address localhost slash user. But if I write a, a root with a parameter in, a, in a less than and greater than signs, this is interpreted as a wildcard, as a parameter, as a variable component. So this root will match any URL that starts with user following something. So it may be user Fulvio is, uh, will be routed by this, uh, or to this function, to the show user profile. So it's a very quick and easy way of sending parameters to pages. One way can be storing that into the session and redirecting to the page, and the other way is just I redirect to a page with a parameter there. And so I'm in, in one link, I'm also embedding some data. Very easy to do. Hmm? Um, in this case, the definition of the function should have one parameter on this function, which is equal to the parameter name in the URL. So right now, all the page function were just a function with no parameter, login, logout, no parameter at all. If I want, I can make a dynamic URL, so with some wildcard in them, and the value of this wildcard will be passed as parameter to the function. Okay? So it's an easy way of passing values around to the next page and so on. Uh, there is a bit more. If you want, these parameters can also be restricted. For example, you can specify that you only want an integer value and not a string in this parameter. So you may request a string or an integer or a floating point value or in general a path. Uh, so that you can know what kind of, and Flask will validate the value for you and will send you, will call your function only if uh, the value is correct. Otherwise it will say 404 invalid page. Uh, calling these dynamic routes is also easy because the URL4 method can generate them. So you don't need to concatenate the string to join the string for getting user slash full view. When you call the user page profile, for example, you in the URL4 method you pass a parameter. So this parameter is interpreted by URL4, which takes profile is the name of the function. URL4 takes the name of the function, uh, checks the profile, checks the route in which this function is published, user, understand that the user has one parameter, username, so finds that URL4 has the username additional attribute, and so replaces this attribute with a proper HTML escaping, if needed, into the URL, and returns that. Hmm? So all the HTML and HTTP encoding of the strings and so on is hidden from us. I have one string that I want to pass as a parameter to one page. I reason in terms of pages, parameters, and values. And then the URL4 maps that into actual URL strings, and the route routing mechanism converts them back from strings into parameters. Actually, our, our impression 
is that we just passed one string as the parameter username to this function with this name. So we can skip thinking about URLs, encodings, and so on. Uh, it's all automatic and, sim automated and simplified by, by Flask, by this routing mechanism in Flask. Um, additionally, which seems a bit strange, you can also define parameters for pages that don't have any parameter declared. So in this case, I applied this uh, next parameter to the login page, to a login page. But the route of this login doesn't specify any next uh, parameter anywhere in the URL. What's happening in this case? Well, the Flask is doing its best to pass this value in any case. So if the parameter is not present or is not named in the same way, it will just append it as a get argument. So the login page can also query or receive this argument by checking the form uh, dictionary. So there are small uh, say, tricks that help us in sending information from page to page. Um, and then the, this last point that I, 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 had, I had to to say before because of the of the prob of the programming problem we had I had actually um, when I route uh, a new URL to a um, to a method to a function to a page function I should specify the list of HTTP methods that can respond. So uh, generally, 99% of HTTP requests are of type get. Get, but get is not the only HTTP verb, the, the only HTTP command that can be used. HTTP defines eight verbs, something like that, of which four or five are used normally. We will learn them uh, in a couple of weeks when we when we uh, will use them actually to integrate different applications. In interactive application, so well, well, when when building websites and not uh, servers, uh, the the only two verbs that we use are get and post. Get is used always, except in forms. When I need to submit a form, I use uh, the post method, and we saw how in the action um, statement of the form itself. I declare that the or index, I declare in the form that the method should be post. The, the main difference between get and post is uh, if there are parameters, how are these parameters encoded? If there are no parameters, get and post are, are do the same thing. If there are parameters, in the case of get, they get encoded in the URL, so after the question mark, and they have a list of parameters. In the case of post, they are encoded in the request body. In HTTP, the request body is, in the, in the get case, it's empty. There are only request headers and no body for a get. For a post, there is a header and a body, and the body will contain the form values in some strange encoding. Uh, um, and this is preferable for sending forms because we don't uh, pollute the, the URL field with strange values. We hide from the user what are the real, the actual values that we are sending. So forms are usually sent by post and all the other pages are usually requested by get. In our web application, for every method, for every function, for every route, we can declare one or more methods that may apply. So we, may, we might have the same URL responding to get, routed to a function, and then the same URL with method of post routed to a different function. It's perfectly legal. They are different types of requests, and we will do that, actually when we will we'll use uh, get for reading and post for writing. But this is, a, is the next uh, step that we do. If we want inside the, the function to, un, to know 
which methods we were called with, we can use the request.method. I, I told you that the request contains everything you need to know about the request. We use the request.form, also request.method is available and will tell you whether you were called with a guest, with a get, or whether you will, we were called with a post method. Okay, so these are, it's a sort of a crash course about uh, websites, interactive websites. One thing is missing from what we saw today, but uh, you will play with that on Monday in the lab. Uh, of course, uh, our pages, fun page functions here, right now only use uh, some simple data and the session storage. Of course, all these methods can also use a database. It's Python code after all. So if last week we were using databases from command line application, from interactive application, we can use the same mechanism here. So it will be very easy not just to store the name into a session variable, a session dictionary, but also to store it into a database or to do a query into a database by using this name to check the information about the user. Okay? So next week in the lab, we'll try, we will try to join web application with database. Good evening.